What's up YouTube? This is Dennis Panuta for tutorials.eu. In this video, you are going to learn how to use cues in C Sharp, what cues are, and what the advantages of using cues are. And before you get started, of course, please hit that like button because it really helps us out and subscribe while you're at it. Okay, let's get started. Hey, and by the way, we also have an article that you can find on our blog that is going over everything that you will see in this video with the code and also the resources. So you can just download them from there, definitely check them out. And maybe you just want to read through it instead of just watching the video or just use it as additional material. So check out the link in the description to get to the blog post. Cues are significant and used a lot by our operating system, for example, to handle task scheduling and many other processes. Cues should be used when the order of the data is important, as we will see in our example. Cues work like real cues in real life, like an airport check-in where the first person in the front desk gets served first, or like in the restaurant drive through where the car in the front will get to order first and when new cars come in, they must wait in the back of the line and will be last served. So we use queues when the order the data comes in is important. So data can be added only from the back and removed from the front and can't access the elements in the middle. It's the FIFO system. So first in, first out. For example, in operating systems, queuing messages, IO requests, mouse movements, and so forth. So they can be executed in the order they came in. Then managing web requests in the server to handle them one by one. So it's a handle congestion. And queuing input in video games, for example, in a fighting game with combo attacks like Street Fighter, where you have to keep track of the user input to determine the combo that will be performed. So let's go ahead and first of all, define a queue. In order to define a queue, you can use the queue keyword. Queues are also part of the generic collections, which means we need to define what type a queue will incorporate. So in this case, it will hold a bunch of integers, but it could hold any other type as well. It could hold strings, it could hold even a whole objects. So you're fully free to define whatever you want this item to hold. So queue, then less than sign, int, greater than sign, and then the name of the queue equals, and then you can initialize it straight away as we do here, where we just create an empty queue that holds integers. Okay, so now we can go ahead and add items to this queue. In order to add items to a queue, you can use the NQ method. The NQ method adds an object to the end of the queue. Okay, so if I add an item like one, for example, this item will be the first one because, well, it's the first one that we enqueued, but it will also be the last one. Okay, so as soon as we add another one, the new item will be the last item in the queue. Okay, so that's how ordering is done. It's similar to a stack, but the difference is that a queue, when you get rid of something, so when you pop an item, it's going to take it from the beginning of the queue. So the item that was created first will be taken away or will be popped out of the queue, so to speak. Okay, so in order to look at the queue's items, we can use the peak method. And this peak method will display the first item in the queue. So the front of the queue, so to speak. So it's like a queue of people where you're at the counter and you want to order something, for example, then the peak method will give you the first person in that queue that is about to order. Okay, so let's run this real quick and see how this is going to look like. And we see the value at the front of the queue is one. Now let's add a couple more values to see how that's going to affect our application. So here I'm going to add the different queue items like so. I'm going to NQ1, then NQ2, NQ3. And I'm just using these numbers one, two, three. They could be any other numbers as well. It doesn't really have to be one, two, three. Okay, so with peaking, we get the item that is at the beginning of the queue. You can see every single time, no matter what we add to the queue, the one is going to be our first item in the queue. So it's going to be the one displayed when we use the peak method. 
Now, in order to get rid of an item from the queue, you would use the DQ method. Okay, so here, queue.dq. So this DQ will now get rid of the first integer of our queue. And it will also store it straight away. So we could store this. Let's call this one Q item, for example. And it will then store the result of this dequeued item. So basically, it will store one in there because that's the first item that we have in the list. And then peaking will display two because now one is not there anymore. The first item is gone. So now the value in the queue will be two because, well, we just dequeued the first item. So it's similar to pop in a stack, but it takes away the item at the beginning of the queue instead of the end of the queue or the end of the stack, however you want to look at it. You can, of course, also try to dequeue an item at the beginning if there are no elements inside of the queue, but you will run into an invalid operation exception. The queue is empty. So you will need to check if the queue is empty or not before running this. So here we can run the DQ method because we know that we just enqueued something. But otherwise, you would use the count property of your queue in order to figure out how many items you have there. So this is the property that you can use, gets the number of elements contained in the queue. And you can then check if that one is greater than zero, for example, to check if there is anything in the queue that you can, for example, dequeue. Okay, so in this particular example, I'm just going to go ahead and use my queue count to double check in a while loop. And for every single item, I'm going to dequeue it and also write down the amount of items that are still in the queue and also the item that was removed. So this line here will remove the item by calling the DQ method. And at the same time, it will display the item right here because that's what we're using here. We're using the string, right? And with this position zero, it will display whatever is the result of the DQ call. And as you can see here, the DQ method will return an integer. So we're going to display a number here. Okay, so let me get rid of this DQ that I used here in order to demonstrate how to DQ an item. And let's run it again. And you can see the value at the front is one. And then we basically start the while loop here. That's the interesting part. So one was removed from the queue. Now we only have two items left. Two was removed from the queue. Now we only have one item left. And three was removed from the queue. Now we only have zero items left. So basically the queue is empty at that point. Quick pause. In this video, you'll learn something about C Sharp. And if you want to learn everything there is to know that you need for the fundamentals and to become a real C Sharp developer, then definitely check out my C Sharp Masterclass in which you're going to learn all of the things you need to know about C Sharp. So you're going to learn how to do the basics, how to use object-oriented programming, how to use WPF in order to create your own user interfaces, how to use databases, how to use link, how to create your own games using Unity, and a lot more. So if you want to become a real C Sharp developer, definitely check out the link in the description below. All right, so let's look at a more or less real world example. Of course, we don't work with databases in this simple example here, but let's say we have an e-commerce platform and we're the seller and we receive a bunch of orders. These orders should be processed so that the service time, so the waiting time for the customer should be held to a minimum. This is why we are going to use queues because they're very practical since we care about the order of the orders coming in. So the order of orders, it's a little uh, of a tongue twister here, but the order of which the data was received. Okay. And by data, I mean the orders themselves. So let's look at this very simple class that we're going to build here. And I'm going to put it inside the same file here, this class order with an order ID property the order quantity property, and then the constructor, which basically just sets those two values when we create an order object. And then we have this print message or this process order method, which will print the order ID of the item that we are currently looking at. So of the order that we are currently looking at. Okay, so now what I would like to do is I would like to 
I actually create methods inside of my program class. So I'm going to put it in here inside of this bracket still. And the methods, they are going to take care of orders from the different branches. So let's say we have two different branches where we can get orders from. Let's say we are selling on Amazon and at the same time at Best Buy, for example, and then we will now get those orders. Now we're not going to make it too complicated where we are going to check which uh, branch is, well, the order of the different branches. This is something you could, of course, see as a little challenge for yourself if you want to develop that. But we're just going to say, okay, give me the orders from branch one in the right order and give me the orders from branch two in the right order as well. Okay, so here this will be branch one with a bunch of orders and then we have the branch two with a bunch of orders. So we're getting the data, let's say we get this data from a database where we are checking, okay, what were the orders and we would probably check them by date. So each order would get a date as well. Here we have the order ID, but usually would also try to store when it was ordered and so forth, but we're going to keep it simple for this example. Okay, so we have now an array of orders in both of those examples. And when we call the method receive orders from branch one and two, they will basically just return an order array. So here, an array of orders. Okay, so that's what this statement here does, return orders. Now in our particular example, the order ID is in fact going to be unique for the two different orders. So they will already be in the right order, so to speak. Okay, so this is order one, this is order two, then we have order three and order four and five from branch two. And then in the evening in branch one, there came another order and somebody purchased 10 of our items. Now in our main method, we can create a queue and let me actually get rid of all of this stuff here. In our main method, we can now go ahead and create a queue of orders. Okay, so here, queue order. You can see that this is not going to be a simple type like integer now, but it's actually going to hold a bunch of orders. That's the cool thing about the queue. So it's not just simple text. And I'm going to call this one orders queue, and I'm going to initialize it straight away right here. And then at this point, we can go ahead and enqueue all of our orders that we get from branch one by using this for loop here this for each loop. So we're going through every single order that I'm going to call O in this for each loop in this iteration in our receive orders from branch one. Now this here will be of type order array. Okay, so when we call this method, it will return an array of orders as you see here. So basically this for each loop will go through the orders that we have inside of this order array and it will look through every single one of them. So O will be first this order, then it will be this order, then it will be that order. And for every one of them, it's going to enqueue those orders. Okay. So that's what this for each loop does. And then we create another for each loop for the other branch as well. So same goes here for each loop order all in orders received from branch two. Okay, so this is branch two, this is branch one. And the same applies. So the same concept applies. So to process the orders, we will go through our queue one by one. And then we will remove the elements from our queue and process them until our queue is empty and all orders are finally processed. Okay, that's why we have this process order method here, which will process the orders. Okay, so now we can go ahead and inside of our main method up here, once we have the orders queue with all of the items in it, we can go through it and we can check if the order queue is not empty. And as long as it's not empty, so as long as the orders queue count is greater than zero, we are going to execute this while loop. And we're going to remove the order at the front of the queue. So the order that came in first, so to speak, and store it in a variable called current order. Okay, so we have this 
order object, which is going to be called current order, which will basically be the result of dequeuing the first item of our orders queue. So basically taking away this item first, then this item, then that item, then this item, then that, and then that one. Okay, and then it will process each and every one of them step by step. So processing in our case will just be something very simple. It will just print it onto the console. But of course you could run something way more complex in the background here. This could trigger some events, sending out an email, for example, to an employee who has then to take care of it or whatever processing system you have employed in your company. All right. And yeah, that's basically it. So now let's run this application to see the results and we can see order one was processed, order two was processed, then order six, then three, four, five. Okay, so we are processing the orders, of course, in the order that we queued them, okay, with, uh, that we enqueued them. You can see here we are enqueuing from branch one first and then from branch two. So just imagine for the following scenario where the orders, they are created in the system internally, but they first have to be accepted and fully pushed to the processing um, entity, whatever that entity is, like the uh, another office or so, for example, and they do it at the end of the day, for example. So first branch one finishes their stuff and they say, okay, well, we uh, accept those orders and then later that day, because let's say they are in a different time zone, for example, branch two says, yeah, uh, we are agree. Well, we send out our orders as approved at that point as well. And then they are started to being processed. Okay. So that's how this example could be considered, for example, right? Otherwise, of course, you would order them straight away based on their ID or based on the time that they were created, okay? All right, so now you have a certain idea of how these orders work and how the queues work. That's the more important part. So now you can create your own queues and use them in your applications. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you liked it. And now please hit that like button if you haven't done so already. And also consider subscribing. And if you love the video, then definitely check out the C Sharp Masterclass. You can find the link with a huge discount in the description down below. It will make sure that you will become really good and a pro in C Sharp programming. All right, so thanks a lot again and check out one of those two videos. See you in the next one.